Hello and welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks for attending today's webinar. Uh, learn Kobe the easy way and discover the real benefits of BIM for FM. During today's webinar, you will learn the best and worst practices of doing Kobe. You'll learn how to help owners come up with uh, BIM data requirements, learn about BIM data quality control, and BIM for FM business scenarios and use cases. Today's session is going to benefit you because you will be learning the best practices, which will reduce the cost of getting good data from design and construction. And you will discover the capabilities of BIM for FM via use cases, which will enable new, more efficient and effective business processes. Today's session should last between 45 to 60 minutes. Um, I will be hosting along with Igor. Uh, we have a lot to go through, so with your permission, uh, we're going to move quickly and answer questions at the end of the session. If you'd like the recording of today's session, uh, a full list of the answers to the questions we asked in the survey prior to today's webinar, along with the slides, uh, please stay to the end, type in your name and details to the chat box to the right hand side. Uh, however, uh, please do do this towards the end of the session because in all fairness, we've had a ton of questions coming out already. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, a bit about me, my name is Barry Hassib. I'm the Managing Director of BIMREC. Uh, BIMREC are an essential BIM recruitment partner for individuals and organizations really looking to win with BIM. We are passionate about helping our candidates and clients overcome any obstacles or hurdles or challenges you're facing throughout your entire BIM journey. We have helped um, and, and we can, shall continue to help uh, companies from small startup companies through to leading contractors, developers, and the such employing uh, tens of thousands of people. As an organization, BIMREC generally work exclusively with the majority of our candidates. Uh, we've achieved superb results for uh, the majority of our clients uh, across all levels, whether you're recruiting for BIM modelers, BIM coordinators, through to the more senior BIM director level and partner level appointments. In, in reply to a question that which we get asked uh, quite often, um, especially from other recruitment consultancies in all fairness is, uh, why is a leading BIM recruitment company holding regular webinars, uh, helping train the industry on, in BIM for free? Uh, well, as you know, uh, BIM is a journey. Some companies and some individuals have had great success stories. Most others, in all fairness, uh, let's say it's been a steep learning curve for them. Uh, our goal is to simply help you win with BIM. Uh, BIM Rec continually pushing the envelope, not only in BIM recruitment, but also in ensuring our candidates and clients have access to, to world-class leaders, uh, le leaders in BIM. Apologies. Today, we at BIMREC would like to show you how to avoid some of the challenges throughout your BIM journey with our expert guest speaker. Therefore, very privileged and proud to announce our expert guest speaker for BIMREC webinar 10.0 is Igor Stargoff. Igor is a president of Ecodomus Lifecycle BIM. Igor is presenting today on how to learn Kobe the easy way whilst discovering the, the real benefits of BIM for FM. With that said, I would now like to pass you over to Igor. Sure, thank you, Barry. Uh, my name is Igor Starkov. I'm the uh, founder of Ecodomus and um, uh, founder of a few other companies in the past. Um, first, the agenda for today's uh, PowerPoint presentation is um, we're going to introduce the company and our work. Uh, we will look at the BIM data requirements and the guidelines development. Uh, we look at the Kobe workflow both from the process and the product data point. Uh, we'll look at the how to control quality control of the Kobe deliverables. We'll have a few uh, examples of how BIM and BAS and FM can use, work together. Uh, what is mobile BIM brings to the um, to practitioners, and uh, how Point Cloud is starting to play a role in the overall BIM discussion. Uh, first, about Ecodomus, we are a software company. We're seven years old, um, started um, in the uh, United States in Washington, D.C., where I'm based in the California and San Francisco, where my uh, other part of the uh, founder is based. 
Um, we have now projects and partners in all parts of the world, um, in Australia, Singapore, China, uh, Middle East, the UK, uh, Europe, etc. We've done probably more COVID projects than all of the other providers put together and work with the largest facility owners and uh, construction firms um, in uh, multiple vertical uh, markets, including the government, uh, healthcare, uh, transportations. We've now signed our fourth airport project. Um, from pretty much any kind of uh, vertical or underground facility that can be managed uh, with the technologies that we have. So let's work uh, from the kind of a bird eye view towards the actually tactical view. The, it all happens if you have uh, the detailed information of what you need to uh, perform. Um, so that's why BIM guidelines are so valuable. We've done guidelines of different tar uh, in addition to developing software, obviously, we were trying to explain to the owners that we work with what is that thing called BIM, right, and how it's supposed to help them into overall life cycle. So the guidelines that we used to develop, uh, they're, uh, they're of different types. So strategic uh, guidelines, for example, they look at the uh, organization as a whole, and they look at the major workflows that can be affected by BIM. There are tactical guidelines, or more detailed, that's where you go to the level of uh, granularity, where you describe particular um, attributes for a, this particular type of equipment. Um, so here are some examples of the guidelines we work with for the University of Southern California or for Kaiser Permanente, which is the largest uh, facility healthcare owner in the United States. Um, some example of what goes into strategic beam roadmap goes into the, um, you know, as I mentioned, what are the workflows or work tracks that may be um, created to utilize BIM for improvements in, uh, in organizational uh, business processes. Uh, we did the root cause analysis, analyzed the process, mapped them, uh, and proposed improvements uh, related to the areas affected by BIM. Um, on the tactical roadmaps, that we do more of those actually than strategic, uh, that's where you define the detailed requirements for um, BIM object attributes. Uh, for assets, that's where we find how the um, information is uh, kind of created and managed. Uh, we, uh, the guidelines actually were created by a company called View by View, and we helped them uh, with some of the information related to the um, Kobe and uh, object attributes. Um, this is, I still believe that uh, these guidelines are one of the most detailed and uh, easy to understand, and it's actually public. Uh, knowledge. So if you just Google for USC BIM guidelines, you'll find them there. Um, they definitely need to be updated. Uh, my recommendation is really uh, kind of look at it and understand that the guidelines need to be updated every two, three years because there's so much uh, movement in the industry and things change. Technologies come up, best practices come up, so, but as the foundation, this is something I would recommend you to look at. So how to create those BIM uh, requirements that are more detailed and strategic, uh, more detailed and uh, tactical? First, uh, we begin with you know popular sentence, begin with the end in mind, ask plain language questions. You know, let's say, how do we service heating units, right? We, we do replace the filters, right? Then we need to know the filter size as well. Then it needs to be added to the requirements. Uh, there are some, um, you know, we need to compare, let's say, fan rotation per minute attributes. Uh, to design specifications. Well, in this case, we need to know design fan RPM value. So this kind of uh, approach helps you to go from the uh, from the end towards the beginning and understand what is the information that uh, needs to be uh, delivered to the architects and contractors so they know what they need to put in the BIM. Because quite often what we hear is a contractor calls us and says, well, my owner said they want to have BIM for a fan or they need to do COVID. Do you know what we need to actually put there? We're saying you don't have to put anything because the owner didn't specify it, right? So what they actually need to specify is something like this. They need to specify these are the attributes we need to see for a fan. These are the documents we need to be linked to a fan. Fans should be named like this. Fans should be linked to HVAC systems. 
Right? So this kind of uh, digitalization is what will help you to uh, calculate the costs, all right? Because when you're bidding on something, you also need to understand how much work will be involved. Because if they don't really tell you anything, you don't have to budget anything. If they request this kind of information, then you will budget some some work because it, it is a few hours of work here, right? So how to implement these guidelines? Um, owners should provide these detailed guidelines, like in the previous example, uh, the previous couple of slides. And then um, if, if they don't know really what needs to be done, and to be honest, 90% of the time they don't really know what they want. So what we typically do is we have the templates from the previous project. And we're saying, well, do you guys want to use something that have been already created by other owners? They say, oh, sure, yeah, let's look at that. And then they just they either adjust it, they make it even more detailed, or they make it less detailed, but at least they have some foundation, the, the, the baseline to work from. Um, then as uh, architects, engineers, and contractors, they look at those owner's guidelines, and then they create their execution plan, saying, this is how we're going to meet your requirements. Uh, the funny thing is that most of the execution plans that I've seen are pretty much universal as if the, uh, the contractor works for the same owner all the time because they have this template and they just change the title of the owner on it and that's that's what they call their execution plan. Uh, but in reality, definitely, you know, one owner will be different in their requirements from the other owner. Uh, how Ecodomus helps is we develop, um, we develop the software called Ecodomus PM that helps you to continuously collect and check quality of that data and those documents of the project. At the end of the project, uh, we can produce the copy deliverable, or preferably we can integrate directly uh, our Ecodomus FM software that contains all of that data with the owner's CMMS CAF application. There are some benefits to direct integration compared to the file-based upload because in this case we can maintain the quality of the uh, models after the project is over. So it's not just a one-time thing, it's actually continuous maintenance of the model's synchronization. And obviously it's a continuous improvement, as I said, guidelines need to be updated, technologies need to be updated, so it's all continuous cycle. Here's what we believe is going to be the uh, the end uh, kind of a end line end of the line picture of integrated lifecycle BIM. You have a system of applications that all work together uh, that cover different workflows. There is no application that will be able to do everything. You know, there, even though some uh, vendors try, they claim that they can build uh, everything. You know, they can do it Kaplan, and they can do CMMS, and they can do BIM, and they can do this and that. Nobody can do that. The only way to actually do it is to create an integrated system of applications where you exchange data, preferably via web services, preferably using the uh, well-defined use cases. Um, and in this case, yes, it's all becoming a, a working environment that will keep your data alive, keep your data in a good shape, and easy, easy accessible, and uh, allowing you to perform lots of uh, useful analytics. Um, so how we achieve that picture, right? Uh, we achieve that using our software tools called um, Lifecycle Building Information Management Tools, like Ecodomus TM and FM. And the thing is, uh, we exist throughout the whole life cycle, that's what the whole point of it, is that we have touch points with uh, different applications, whether, you know, in the design um, with uh, Revit, old plants, Bentleys, and Archicads, uh, through construction using ProLines, ProLog, Econex, or whatever, through the operation and maintenance with Maximus, Arcubus, Tririgus, Planos, and uh, tons of other applications, right? So the goal is really to create a product database that will allow you to synchronize um, all of these different workflows and different applications. Uh, so again, Nicodemus PM is the software that uh, helps you to collect the data, uh, enable the COVID management, perform quality control, convert the, um, just to remind you guys, the BIM is not only, uh, information model can be created not only in the specific, specific parametric applications like uh, Revit, Archicad, or OPLAN. Uh, you can also use um, uh, advanced uh, CAD now, the CAD packages to create a pretty decent information model. The other question is, uh, is it the best way? No, it's not. But some uh, good 3D CAD models may be better than some bad BIM models. 
that are you know created in the authoring application. Um, that's where we um, collect the documents and assign them to the objects, uh, perform energy management verification, perform field bin data entry. So that's that's the project side, right? We are working within a particular project domain. All of that data goes into the database, common database that is online, or on the client's on-premises servers. We support both uh, modes. Uh, Economos FM is what the owners are using after the project is over, so they can maintain the data for the duration of the uh, building life. That's where they can integrate it with the work orders, GIS, BAS, and everything else. Um, so which are the... Um, so the focus of the Economos PM, the application that I mentioned earlier, is uh, utilizing Kobe as the process. Um, we definitely recommend standardized um, on Kobe because it uh, makes the results more affordable. What it means is that if I have uh, 200 clients and all of them have the same uh, process like Kobe, then I can spread the cost between 200 of them. You know, if I have to come up with a custom handover workflow for each one of them, obviously the cost is going to be much bigger. Um, we obviously, uh, what Kobe also helps is it, it's a very granular approach to the managing the data. So it enables the scalability and mapping uh, different uh, data sources to enable the big data. I know that everybody hates the words big data, but I still keep them here because it is a pretty complex data structure. Um, and uh, to normalize it using the granular approach like Kobe is, it's pretty helpful. Um, what Kobe also allows you is to reuse information. Um, unfortunately, right now there's the concept in the industry that uh, it's, it's an Excel file and you need to populate Excel file, populate Excel file. Uh, in reality, a lot of information that you're using there can be stored uh, and preset, uh, so you can just reuse it and it's going to be much more affordable to use it versus typing it in Excel file all the time. Um, what we also allow, it allow data collection, different collection methods to, avail, to fit available budget. You know, some people will prefer to deal with uh, online apps, some will prefer to use the smartphones to populate the data, some will use the iPad, some will use Excel files. You need to understand how, uh, what is the, you know, what is the project budget and what are your project team members are capable of doing because some will say I've never worked with the online application so just give me Excel file I will fill it out. Uh, that's fine, you know, it's, it's, it's not the most efficient way but it can be done. Um, the, and very important uh, point here is about the quality control because uh, in reality uh, in all our, my work with BIM um, I've never seen a single file that we can just uh, open and say great data set, great model, let's just use it. Every single model we've had uh, had problems from the top engineers, top BIM modelers uh, from around the world. So just uh, letting you know. <laughs> On the Kadamas FM side, uh, there are more and more owners who are asking about maintenance of the data. You know, in the past, in the first few years, as we were promoting this concept, Everybody was asking questions like, so how do I get my BIM into my FM? And we were explaining it to them. Now there are more questions. Uh, so, okay, let's say I got this BIM into my FM. So how do I maintain its accuracy over the next 10, 20 years? So that, that's, the, that's where it becomes more important to define these um, use cases for the integrations, define the interfaces for maintaining the model, to access the model, and um, to see how the existing uh, FM applications like CAFM, CMMS, and BAS, how it can be enhanced by these additional capabilities of tools like Ecodamus FM. Um, about Kobe itself, um, just for you, those of you who have heard it for the first time recently, it's an open industry standard for collecting and exchanging project data. Uh, the, the most popular use case for Kobe is the upload of handover data into FM tools. Um, the benefit of it is that uh, since the data is being collected throughout the project, not at the last month, right? As you collect the data, uh, you are understanding how this facility is going to be operated, right? So it's a continuous, it's a lean data collection versus, you know, uh, ad hoc uh, crawl to collect the data. The issue with Kobe that a lot of people don't understand is it does not say what data should be collected. It just says this is the format. 
right? So we definitely recommend to spend quite a bit of time to understand this issue of what data should be collected. Well, I mentioned the, the, the BIM guidelines, right? So that's that's the uh, item that takes a lot of uh, efforts to figure out. Yeah, we were the first COVID certified uh, software back in 2009. Uh, let me show you a video of um, how this process can work with the sample model. So as you see in front of you, here is the, uh, it's one of these BIM common files that is available from Building Smart Alliance. Uh, it's an open uh, source Revit file. Um, so we run um, the Revit model here and activate my BIM connector, which is the plugin that allows us to extract the data into our application. So in this case, I select only mechanical equipment and electrical equipment as of interest for me and select the facility to which I want to export this data. So I select ABC facility, click on export, and uh, it's packaging data from the model, such as room systems, zones, everything that is in the model, sends this data to Ecodomus website, right? To, to, I'm sorry, to, to our Ecodomus web database. Um, so the data is now there. So it's extracted from your local um, um, or from the server um, a Revit file, and now it exists in the SQL database. Here is the SQL database within the Kodomos PM. We see that we have extracted these 16 uh, types. We extracted um, for those two, uh, for mechanical electrical equipment, right? We extracted 199 components uh, of those 16 types. We have spaces extracted. And let's say we go back to the uh, types here and look at our chiller, the one that we selected in the Revit model. Here is the type, and we see the um, standard uh, fields for this type, you know, warranty, model number, manufacturer. We also extracted extended attributes. Pretty much everything that was in Revit for that um, asset is now here. What we want to do is now update these properties using the product library. Let's assume that we have that chiller in our product library. So I look for that chiller, find it, and they're saying, okay, well, let's assign this chiller to my library. BAMS, and now warranty information is here. We see that it's three years duration for parts, one for labor, and it's a chiller one manufacturer that is assigned to it. We now have the voltage information and capacity and frequency. We also got the documents uh, linked to that. So in a manual and the the middle document are now assigned to this asset type. All right, so obviously it's all sample data. So um, now let's say we need to update uh, information about the components, about that instance of that type. So I look at it and it, as, as usual, it came in from Revit with pretty ugly name. 633-703 doesn't tell me anything about this asset. So I replace it, I rename it as Chiller one, so I name it Chiller one. It's now it's clean, right? I, I understand what it is. Uh, okay, well now I need to collect serial number, installation date. My field guy doesn't know what Kobe or BIM is. He pulls out his Ecodomus mobile application on on his uh, Android smart smartphone, selects uh, installation date field, enters the date, says okay and now it's the field that is being updated. Now he goes to the serial number field. Okay, that's the serial number. Updated, saved. All right, superintendent is done with his job. Uh, now we move on to the commissioning agent test. We need to review the documentation and take the photos of the equipment. He selects the same way the chiller one on his Ecodomus iPad application. Uh, looks at the component chiller one. As you see, serial number is already here because the superintendent entered it, right? Uh, we also review the documents. Okay, they are here because we pulled them from the uh, library. And so now the superintendent just needs to take a photo. So he activates the iPad camera. Uh, the photo is taken. Uh, the person obviously needs to name the photo because that's how you cannot have a document without a name. So let's say we call it photo one. And now it is not only uh, I've taken it's linked to that particular asset, the chiller one. We go back to our online app. We see that uh, fields are updated. You see, right, serial number, installation date. They were updated from the field. 
And the document, the photo one, is here. It's also attached because we took it in the field and now it's here. All right, well, we have information. Now let's go into our expert. We see that uh, there is the um, expert uh, facility. We can filter by organizations, by the way, uh, for which particular data set is needed to be assigned. And uh, now it extracts uh, COBE data. And here's your COBE Excel file. And here's your chiller one with the serial number and necessary information. So that's um, kind of a five minute workflow that shows you the whole COBE thing. Um, so how do we do that? Where do we start? Uh, first, you need to specify who provides the data. So you need to have a responsibility matrix, right? So this company provides design providers this, uh, contractor provides this, that, uh, subcontractor number one provides this, subcontractor number two provides this, right? Uh, when is it collected? Because what, uh, still, even those who wanted to copy day quite often, uh, you know, say, well, we will do copy, but we will do it the same way as we did it before. So we'll do it the last month. Uh, and the challenge is uh, you will not have a good data by the time the project is over if uh, some subs have finished their job and moved out. Um, so you need to link it to, the uh, to your construction schedule. Um, how is it entered? Again, you select what the interface is appropriate. Who checks and verifies data? Even for some owners who wanted to do this if, because they didn't assign anybody to check for the data, right? The data quality was pretty bad. Um, most of the projects we worked on, uh, if they did not have a person uh, responsible for checking the data, the results were pretty poor. Um, so we, that's, uh, as I was showing you before, entering data once, if an object is placed in BIM with proper attributes, we can automatically extract it. If not, we populate it uh, using one of the approaches uh, shown in the video. Um, what we also can do is we can assign, like I mentioned, we can filter by organization. So you can actually assign what asset types are appropriate for one uh, designer and for another designer or for one contractor or another contractor. So you can filter your um, fields and your Kobe files by the providers to see who is responsible for what. Um, yeah, so here's the again uh, showing that you can edit the data on mobile devices like iPads and phones or online. The challenge is that you're going to have definitely is uh, with the quality. Uh, most of the modelers are still drafting using the altering tools, the modeling tools instead of modeling. Um, modeling built MEP systems is the biggest culprit. It's the, there's a lot of problems with MEP systems modeling. Um, properties, uh, everybody is loading whatever properties they see uh, even though those properties don't really uh, bring any value to the owner, sometimes you have you know, an air handling unit that has 50 attributes and all of those 50 attributes are related to the geometry of the air handling unit instead of actually having the operational values. But the owner looks at it and says, oh, wonderful, 50 attributes, that's so cool. Uh, in reality, uh, what's the point? Uh, so that's, that's the challenge that you're going to be having and we're helping our clients really to figure out how to clean those things and how to avoid the problems. Um, so the quality control report that we have help you analyze what are the challenge, what are the basic Kobe problems and what are the extended Kobe issues, you know, what kind of, uh, what missing attributes uh, particular asset types have. So in this case I see that my uh, a air handling unit only have uh, equipment hazard field uh, missing and the air cooled chiller that has pretty much the same requirements is missing about 12 different fields not populated. So we, that's something that we can capture. And um, now let's talk about use cases. First of all, there is no such a thing as beam for fm because it's just too broad. Um, every model uh, is built based on particular use case. Right now, the pretty much 95% of all beam projects use one use case only. It's called coordinated view. It's, uh, it, it is used only for class detection, right? So in the regular language. Um, in reality, um, the, uh, all of these uh, uses that owners want to uh, apply, they are so different that the model can be built in so many different ways. Right. So for those who are interested in this topic more, I would suggest this book, The for Facility Managers, published by International Facility Management Association. 
Uh, but uh, again, so uh, when when the owner or the client says, um, "I want to use Beam for FM," you need to figure out the particular use case. What exactly are you going to do with that model? Are you going to use it for work orders? Are you going to use it for energy efficiency? Are you going to use it for space optimization, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Because in this, each one will put additional demands on your modeling efforts. Uh, here's the one example of how uh, Beam and building automation system integration can work together. Um, so this is the data center, you know, racks and chillers. So what I have, yeah, it's in my web application, Ecodomus FM. And uh, what I'm having here is I have a chiller um, which has a attributes such as supply water temperature. It's now 15 degrees. As you see, we support different interfaces, including uh, multiple languages like Chinese, etc. So 15 degrees is fine. Uh, now, we would say it goes to 22 degrees. It's above the threshold, um, and uh, something is happening. So BAS activates uh, a secondary chilled uh, water package, and we want to see what, uh, what are those additional um, elements that are activated and what are the valves that are activated. So uh, the system sends a notification, an email, says the value of this temperature uh, is above the norm. So the technician gets that email, he clicks on that link, and uh, the browser opens up with the Codomus. The model is loaded, and it shows that this chiller is affected. It's in red. So we turned on this equipment. There are two valves that are now opened, and this chiller that is now opened. Right. So that's a, that's a potential use case that can be applied. Uh, more advanced use cases related to integration of simulation with the actual data. So Ecodomus is using um, the COBE data in addition to uh, values such as operating schedules, um, uh, weather information, and some other data to uh, create a simulated energy model that is uh, received by integration between Ecodomus and Energy Plus. Energy Plus is the software for US Department of Energy. Um, so we uh, place here in orange, as you see here, these are the simulated values received from Energy Plus after we submit to them all of the uh, building info. And in blue, we see the data from the actual sensors that are explaining that uh, for this particular room, which is room 1046, uh, the values are significantly uh, different. You know, they overlap only 20% of the time. So something is wrong here, either with the sensor or calibration or uh, maybe some, you know, dampers don't work properly. So, so it allows you to pinpoint the energy problems more efficiently than just uh, analyzing it uh, other ways. Uh, using the um, information, uh, again, using the models on the tablets, devices, definitely is popular right now. Accessing the models, accessing the data, allowing the editing data and viewing the documents. Pretty much your whole library can be carried with you all the time. Um, tablets are fine, but uh, I personally like my uh, smartphone. It's my Galaxy Note that allows me to see the model and see the uh, values uh, related to, let's say, work orders or inspections that we receive from the work order tools. And uh, now let's talk about a little bit the point cloud. Here is our Ecodomus interface, the same one you saw right now with the 3D parametric beam. It also supports the point clouds. So in this case, um, I can utilize, I can also use viewpoints the same way as you would use viewpoints in Navisworks, but for the point cloud here. And I also, I can tag my assets within the point cloud. So here I have my tower light asset showing me information pulled in. So I can choose whether to, to look at the same object from my bin in point cloud or in 3D parametric bin. Pros uh, is the cheaper because you can send the guy there, he scans the whole area in one day. It's highly realistic, so it's, uh, it has more information that would be able to show you. Uh, you can measure uh, within the point cloud. Uh, the cost, you still need to create drawings, obviously, to create, uh, to create uh, something. You cannot do that from the point cloud. Uh, but and, and you cannot isolate um, objects and systems like you can do in, in 3D parametric BIM. But they're definitely complementary one to another, so we see uh, owners not at starting to uh, like this approach and getting to uh, scan the facility, not only at the end of the construction, but also in, in the middle of the construction. So 
they could have um, um, like point clouds of uh, behind the wall utilities. Right? So for the renovation, quite helpful. So that's that's kind of a part of my um, PowerPoint. So now uh, we can probably go to Q and A. I, I know you do have another web another webinar to uh, to get to. So I will jump straight into the questions, if if that's okay. Sure. Fantastic. Um, we end up with projects where the client wants, needs BIM Level 2 to provide the process and model as per PAS 1192-2 is relatively straightforward. What should we advise on Kobe slash FM? As an architect, what is required of me in terms of Kobe on a project? Uh, we don't have enough knowledge of FM and requirements uh, later in the process. So um, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, typically, uh, owners specify what the uh, architects or contractors uh, need to provide within the model. We have projects where architects pretty much were let off the hook. They didn't provide anything. Um, and the contractors picked up the tab and developed information for them. Um, we see some resistance from the architects to engage in here because they think, oh, it's not our scope of work to deal with data. Sure. But in reality, I think they're missing the market because uh, there's a huge opportunity for the architects to stay with the owner after the project over and support those models. So the next time the owner wants to renovate something, they know who to call versus you, you know, as an architect who originally designed this building, you're going to be bidding on it again if you have not been involved with the owner on it. So it's becoming a competitive advantage to the architects if they are getting involved properly. Sure. But again, it's uh, it's typically the um, owner's requirements of what they need to uh, uh, deliver. Typically, um, designers um, have to provide the core foundational data, such as um, asset names, asset locations, um, and uh, maybe suggest the systems that they are connected to if they are involved, if they are uh, working together with the engineers. Um, and then the contractors populate that data with the field information, like you know, model numbers, serial numbers, and other. So, so that's um, that. That's how it works right now. Fantastic, thank you. Um, what advancements have you included in your FM program, Ecodomus, that allow uh, easy input from the GC side? Um, for the GC side, um, I, I showed a couple of examples of the mobile tools, like the smartphones and iPads, and the online interface. Um, it definitely, all of that is created, so it, it makes the work related to the data collection easier. Uh, quality control reports uh, help you to understand whether your subs uh, achieved what they needed to achieve, so it becomes a kind of a control environment for the general contractors to uh, manage the data more efficiently. So that's the whole point of Ecodomus PM, is to help the contractors and architects to um, the, uh, collect the data faster, cheaper, and with uh, higher quality. Fantastic, thank you. Who checks the final uh, Kobe deliverables? Uh, is it always the FM guys? Uh, obviously, the owners is the final benefactor, so yeah. they have to check it. But in reality, because the facility managers uh, don't have enough knowledge of the data science um, or data management, yeah. they um, in the best examples we've seen, they hire and outsource firm, some, something like they do with commissioning when they hire a third party uh, agent to check both architects and contractors, right? Yeah. The same way they hire a commissioning for the virtual data. And we've seen different names for that. You know, some people call it a virtual commissioning agent or data curators or whatever. But you know, the same way as you check the physical structure, somebody needs to check the virtual structure. Sure. Okay. Fantastic. Another question is coming. Uh, we will be transitioning to using Kobe. What are the greatest benefits and challenges? Uh, well, the definitely the benefits of uh, if Kobe is the ability to enable uh, all of this workflow that I was showing earlier here on this slide. I think somewhere. Where is my slide with the benefits? Here it is. Right. So uh, you can. With Kobe, you have obviously making it uh, 
okay, capability to make it uh, faster, cheaper, with higher quality, but then you have the benefits for um, utilizing the energy analysis, like I was showing you this commissioning sure. uh, use case example, right? So you can identify where the problems with the energy is uh, with more detail that you have right now. The sure. risk management, you know, the very popular use cases, where is the shutoff valve uh, for my particular uh, piece of pipe? Sure. Um, or we had a presentation for one uh, supermarket client that uh, with all of the shelves were modeled and each shelf was linked to the uh, particular sales data and we could highlight in different results which shelves are meeting their sales targets and which are not. You know, this is not related to facility maintenance at all, sure. but it helps to visualize the uh, business process. Fantastic. So all, all this is enabled by a structured, uh, very granular data sets. Sure. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, should Kobe be used by the contractor to input non-model parameters to the model elements using an Excel import tool? I know. Uh, well, Excel, as I said, Excel, everybody who worked with Excel, and I assume everybody who worked with it, uh, understand that you can enter anything and it will not really uh, tell you that you did it well or bad. There's limited capabilities for the um, data validation. Yeah. Um, most of the buildings have so much data that Excel may not be even able to handle that because for a decent sized facility you have tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of rows of data. Sure. So the files become very large and difficult to handle. So Excel is used, um, the, role, the whole point of Kobe uh, using Excel file is to show that it is um, to show it for the average, you know, for the layman, uh, that it's not really that complex, that it's just a database. Um, Kobe, as you guys all know, is based on IFC. It's, uh, it's one of the model view definitions. So that means that, um, but to show IFC to a person who is not prepared, it's going to scare them, definitely. That's why uh, Excel file was used to explain that, yes, you can, for some facilities, you can even collect it even in Excel. Right? So people would not be scared. But in reality, it is a, it's, a, it's a complex, large data set, and it needs to be handled the same way as any other data sets are managed. So like accounting data also can be handled in Excel, right? But I don't know any organization that is using Excel to run their accounting. Sure. Okay, fantastic. Uh, how much effort would it uh, would it take to make a Kobe compliant model as compared to one that does not? Uh, assuming that both models contain the same amount of information. So in, in reality, pretty much any model that you have uh, is Kobe compliant because Kobe is just the format of the uh, of storing the data from the model. The issue is is the model quality is good enough because some of the Kobe rules may not be uh, met. Like, for example, within a, your model, there is an asset located inside of a, a space, sure. right? Uh, the way how you place that asset inside of that space may affect whether the Kobe picks up the location property of that asset automatically or not. Because if you didn't model the space correctly, uh, your B modeling application may not understand that this asset is in this space, right? Um, so you can, when you export into Kobe, you will see that this asset doesn't have the space property and like, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's just because the way how the modeling was done is not, it was not correct because most of those applications, uh, they assign uh, objects to systems and spaces and to the type they'll do it automatically. So if you model correctly, then your Kobe data extraction will look pretty, pretty well. Okay. Um, okay. Fantastic. How can the owner evaluate the quality and completeness of a handover BIM content? Uh, they can run reports and something like I showed earlier, which is um, <coughs> understanding which um, documents have been assigned from the list that they've specified or which um, uh, for properties have been uh, collected and which have been missing. Uh, it's not easy to collect the data, really, because manufacturers are still not completely on board providing the data that is required. Sure. Um, and um, so it takes time and effort, and some of the properties that owner may want not even are available from the manufacturer. So there will be always some, some data that is missing. It's just 
it, it needs to be a process where both sides understand the challenges and are flexible enough um, to work together. Okay, fantastic. Great. When was Kobe first used and what are the success stories of using Kobe? Interesting question um, for you. Yeah? <laughs> sure. Um, it, uh, it was, uh, there were some researches done as the Kobe was um, created. It was created originally by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's the American uh, agency uh, working with NASA and a few other government owners. Um, they did some test pilots. The first commercial project that I know is the Texas A&M University in 2009, our project that we worked with, uh, with those guys. Um, it's been used on dozens, uh, if not hundreds, of projects right now. I think mostly dozens. I don't think it's hundreds. Yeah, right. um, dozens of projects around the world. Uh, but you see, the degree to which it was implemented is completely different. Because um, for some projects, uh, only very generic information was populated. For others, uh, there was more information populated. Um, some files we've seen are so horrible, I wouldn't even call them. <laughs> Sure. I, I saw an example where the contractor took the sample copy file from the Building Smart website, um, copied in a two worksheets, they copied equipment data, they didn't even clean up the other work from the old sample data. No. That, that happens. Oh, well, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the best, uh, what is the best method of bi uh, bi directional link between BIM models, COBE, and FM solutions? Um, obviously, the establishing the system uh, of records, like I mentioned uh, in this case, let me pull up that slide. Uh, here it is, right? So, uh, so how we do that is we first define um, the particular use case of integration because when they say I want to integrate my CMMS with BIM, uh, that doesn't say really much. Anymore. Do you want to just exchange data one way? Do you want to populate it from the model to the CMMS? Or you want to be able also to push some updates from the CMMS into BIM? Do you want to exchange work orders? from the model and the viewer or not? Do you want to be able to create work orders from the, let's say, iPad application into your maintenance management system or not? Um, so there's so many uh, hidden uh, issues there that without a clear requirement specification, um, it's difficult to establish how the integration works. But after you create the business rules, the actual integration is pretty simple. Sure. Uh, any developer can map fields uh, using standard APIs. It's just a matter of a, a month or two. But the challenge is really, you know, de developing those workflows and making sure that the client um, agrees to that. Typically, we work with large owners, yeah. and they have multiple stakeholders. So uh, your BIM champion working for the owner may say, "Yeah, this is a great idea," and the actual facility technician says, "Oh, that's a horrible idea." Sure. So even within their organizations, they need to agree, um, and that may be that may take months. Collaboration. We have some yeah, we have, there are so many issues. We had one integration project that took a year uh, because uh, it took us almost nine or ten months to go through the security wow. clearance. You know, they hired a special company to go to analyze the security of the systems, and they, they you know, make the actual work was one month, and you know, wow. then. In month took uh, various emails and uh, files sent back to each other. So, sure. okay. Uh, how BMS SCADA system connect to data rich BIM models? Uh, similarly, um, when you define the use cases, you define how the connections are being done. Uh, for example, um, we prefer to use open standards like uh, BACnet, OPC, and similar. Yeah. Uh, that will increase the uh, opportunity for it because uh, all of these BAS implementations are so custom that without open standards, it's going to be, make it difficult. We did have um, integrations using proprietary APIs like Schneider Electric uh, Structureware or Honeywell EBI, right. but uh, most of the time we suggest using the middleware um, and they use some, one of the open standards to exchange data. Most of the time we read data from BAS because they don't like us to be able to update data in BAS. Sure. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, another question. Are, are there any specific model or offering requirements or methodologies that are required to facilitate Kobe Smash FM? Uh, uh, are there any specific uh, model offer, offering requirements uh, or methodologies that required to yeah, yeah, yeah. that are required okay, okay. to facilitate Kobe FM? Yeah, there are definitely some tips and tricks that we have observed that work better than other. Yeah. Um, by when when you when you work with the model and you clean it up, you definitely see some. Uh, some workflows that uh, are more efficient. Um, we typically uh, help our partners and clients by providing them with those uh, documentation, you know, what to look for in the model to make yeah. sure that it's uh, more appropriate for the end user utilization. Sure. So, yeah, we do help. Okay, fantastic. What are the steps and stages to, the cl to collect BIM requirements from the different project stakeholder, stakeholder when BIM for FM is a requirement in the early stage? How is the process meeting tools and deliverables? Uh, that's a pretty complex uh, question because uh, it depends on so many different factors. Sure. It depends on the um, type of the facility. It depends on the timeline. The requirements of the owner, uh, capabilities of the project team members. Um, so, if we would start developing uh, the workflow um, for a large project, it may take two, three months. Uh, for a small project, it may take a few weeks. But it's always um, a custom way of how we define the workflows. The standards are standard, uh, you know, like uh, Kobe, Omniclass, Uniclass, IFC, all of that is obviously not changing. What changes is the, um, you know, who does what, when, how. Yeah. Right? So that's, the, that's the issue. Okay, so that leads on perfectly to this question. Uh, can you explain any differences between Kobe adoption and standards in the US and the UK? And can you explain how Kobe can be used on infrastructure? Uh, for, for infrastructure, we do have uh, several projects where, uh, that are infrastructure projects. Um, we had, uh, I have some examples of how it can be used with the metro stations and uh, rail stations and uh, airports. Um, we have uh, some examples of the civil work. Um, so it, is, it can be used. It's um, really uh, kind of official uh, recommendations for Kobe is to use it for maintainable assets. Yeah. So whether those maintainable assets are underground, like a metro station, or they are above the ground in the office building, doesn't matter. Sure. Uh, but uh, if you start applying it to, let's say, a road, highway, or pipeline, then it's um, you know there are some different uh, differing uh, points of views on this subject. There's the Kobe for all inspectivity in the UK that is trying to address this issue uh, in the US, they haven't picked it up. Uh, in general, US and UK, Kobe, uh, at this point, they're almost the same, but um, I'm afraid they're drifting apart a little bit. So um, how is going to be happening, uh, or what is going to happen over the next few years, I don't really know. Obviously, it would be great if it would be the same standard. Sure. But um, I've seen that there is now Kobe UK, there is the you know the default Kobe that was originally. So um, I saw the contract in the Middle East that says use Kobe standard, don't use Kobe UK, so uh, it's got to be confusing. Yeah, okay. um, but um, hopefully uh, all the parties that work on the standard will reconcile their issues and will have one standard versus the regional standard. Fantastic. Super. Okay. Uh, how do you explain uh, what Kobe is in a concise way? Many of my clients want want you to explain Kobe to people who have no FM background. Remember the what is BIM days. We are in the what is Kobe days now. Uh, well, it's a, it's, it's a standard format for the facility data exchange. So uh, I don't know how to make it simpler than I that. Could, couldn't, couldn't be more concise than that. Huh? <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, what data should be in the, in the BIM and what uh, should be in the database? Uh, we uh, that's a good big question because a lot of um, modelers trying to squeeze everything inside of the authoring uh, file, uh, which has nothing to do with this kind of data. My feeling is that if a particular data point can be used within the authoring application, yeah. let's say you want to you want to see the total uh, airflow rate for the uh, HVAC system, 
because it may be helpful for your engineering calculations. Sure. Then you may have that field in the authoring application. Yeah. If there's a field that has no value for the modeling, then why keep it inside of the model? Sure. Right? So let's have it in the external application. Okay, fantastic. Are you are you okay? I'm uh, cautious of um, time. Are you are you okay for a few more questions? Uh, well, let's have a last question. And then okay, have... fantastic. Um, do FM personnel need to understand BIM authoring software? Uh, no, the facility managers uh, will never be modelers. Yeah. Uh, so what they need is they need to have a simple, uh, easy to use access to the uh, what model offers. Okay. And um, that's why we were developing the interfaces that you guys saw because we try to minimize the number of the buttons and capabilities that would would be needed for the for the beam authoring vendor, but I'm sorry, beam authoring user, but not for facility technician. Fantastic. Well, uh, I will thank thank you thank you for your time. Um, if you could just go back to the slide so people could see how best to get in contact with you again. Um, sure. Make it easy for everybody to get. Feel free to email me. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Fantastic. Thank you again, Igor, for today's webinar. It's very informative. For those of you live today and for those of you watching this video back via one of our, cha one of our cha channels, um, I don't confess to know exactly why everybody does show up uh, to all of our webinars. However, now that you are aware what uh, BIMREC can offer, which is world-class training for both our clients and candidates. Please do not get, in, please do not hesitate to to get in contact with myself or the office. Um, a few of you have asked in the chat box uh, why we do do this. Well, here at BIMREC, we firmly believe in offering immense value to our candidates and our clients, uh, offering world-class training to a candidate pool, which helps ensure our our clients can have the, the best of the best, pick of the bunch. Um, and we'd like to create a long-term partnerships with both our candidates and our clients. Please do not hesitate to contact me directly via email on the screen here, barry at bimrec.com. That's B-A-R-I-E at bimrec.com. Or forward an email to principals at bimrec.com. That's principals at bimrec.com. With that said, thank you everybody for attending today. I look forward to presenting the IONAPS webinar, which is with Rob Charlton. Thank you so much. All take care. Thanks now. Bye-bye.